Hello and welcome once again. This is week two of the Slate Breakdown. I'm Big Italy 42. He is Denny Carter at CD Carter 13 on Twitter. And of course, you wrote a uh, nice comprehensive piece here breaking down all the games of the Slate, starting with the Thursday night game, which none of us seem to have a whole lot of interest in to begin with. I mean, I didn't even watch it, which was really rare. I mean, it was Thursday night, I saw it was 14 0, and I was just. I kind of moved on. It wasn't wasn't much to see. I didn't have any. I didn't play any of the Thursday night games, so it didn't really matter to me. But uh, it seemed like it was an exciting finish. But the rest of it kind of uh, kind of a ho hum type of game. Yeah, I I had the Chiefs defense in a few places, uh, which looked great in the first half, and then kind of kind of fizzled out there. But I didn't have much going on. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that one didn't have much, but we didn't mu- miss much. That's sometimes the good thing on Thursday nights where you end up not playing and definitely don't miss out on a lot. Um, starting off here, the first game on Sunday, it's going to be an interesting one from a DFS perspective because it doesn't have a particularly high total, 45 points. Um, Bills and Patriots essentially in a pick em here. And obviously this is Rob Gronkowski, but it's also the toughest matchup he's maybe ever going to see. I mean, this is a Bills defense that's very good top to bottom, and they're great against tight ends. So um, give me your take here because obviously you're, what are your favorite players here too? Ty God, Ty God Taylor's at this one as well. That's right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I don't, I, I, I would never say, you know, fade Gronk across the board. Yeah. But like you said, uh, this matchup is objectively really bad. Um, so uh, Rex Ryan seems to know how to handle Gronk. Last, uh, his, his Jets last year uh, held, held Gronk to um, 98 yards and one touchdown over two games. Um, you know, for a normal tight end, that's pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, for Gronk, that's keeping him in check. Yeah. Um, uh, another thing is that the Bills, uh, the Bills' defense is really tough uh, against against opposing tight ends. Uh, last year, uh, tight ends averaged um, under four receptions a game, and uh, the touchdowns were kind of amazing. 0. 0.12 touchdowns per contest against Buffalo from tight ends. Uh, so basically, tight ends are not scoring touchdowns much against the Bills. You know, still, uh, I think that that. You know Gronk has as high as high a floor as anybody. Still, he might just not have that ceiling this week. And um, getting on to uh, to cut to Ty God, Ty Goat. Um, uh, you know, well, like I said last week, uh, as long as you believe that a mobile uh, quarterback will have um, neutral or positive game script on his side, then he is a reasonable play. And here we have Tyrod Taylor again. In a game that Vegas likes to be very close, I, like you said, it's a pick 'em right now. Yeah. Uh, both teams are are projected for twenty two and a half points. Uh, so Taylor will not likely not be forced to the air early and often. He's going to have that you know running ability on on his side and that option on his side. And we saw you know the best thing about Tyrod I think right now is that we saw that you know even if say the Patriots get a lead here. I don't think that he's a disaster through the air. I think he's actually a, 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 a legit passer. I'm, I'm not saying he's he's a great passer, but I, I don't see him as a, a like a Terrell Pryor in you know in previous years. Yeah. Um, I think that he's a lot more steady uh, steady than that. So I I like him still priced very very low. I still like him as a cash game play. Yeah, and I mean he was a, like you've mentioned he was efficient and he lo- he was making good decisions, which is certainly good for a guy you know a younger guy. Um, making, you know, a spot, well, not a spot start, but wasn't expected to be a starter even like a month ago. So I, I thought he looked good, and I was, I won't say surprised, but he, he looked composed, which isn't something you usually see from a player in that type of situation. So um, next one up, not a whole lot of interesting plays in this one, 41 points. We've got the Panthers against the Texans, obviously. Arian Foster now officially ruled out. Only he really thought he was going to play this week anyway, so we weren't really anticipating much there. Alfred Blue is going to get the start again, but that's not an enticing option for me really at all. Um, mm-hmm. DeAndre Hopkins, though, one of the, I won't say surprise necessarily, but one of the best performers in week one. They relied on him quite a bit. And then Greg Olson on the opposite side was a guy that we thought would be relied on a lot. Had a touchdown call back, and aside from that, did absolutely nothing in a really boring game against Jacksonville. Yes, it really was a horrendous game last week. Uh, I, I mentioned in my article that I don't hate the Jonathan Stewart uh, Carolina defense stack. Uh, I mean, Stewart is a little dinged up, you know, as usual, uh, but he's expected to play as far as we can tell right now. And the Carolina defense is uh, at home favored. You know, they're they're a really good play against uh, an offense that, as we saw last week, is probably going to commit a lot of turnovers. Uh, so we want, you know, we want Ryan Mallett 
throwing the ball <laughs> um, into that defense, and I think that's that's what we're going to get. And if that happens, then you know the Panthers, which the Panthers with a with a terrible passing game, are going to have to keep it on the ground. So that's that's why I I like that stack. And then you know, getting back to DeAndre Hopkins, he, he's still outside the top ten priciest uh, receivers in DFS on both FanDuel and, and DraftKings. So. Um, you know, I, I think we're going to see another game where he gets 10 targets at least. We could see him get 15 targets. That's not an out of the realm of possibility. So, I, I, again, I think that he's a nice play. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they, there's really no other option, a reliable option, at least in that offense. So he's definitely going to see see plenty of opportunities in this one. And the next one's going to be an interesting one once again. The Bears and the Cardinals, 45-point total here. Carson Palmer facing off against a bad defense here. And he was he was a, the sexy value play last week, not, not named Tyrod. And he paid off. I mean, over 300 yards, three touchdowns. He looked good, even with Michael Floyd not being 100%. Obviously, Andre Ellington banged up now. Not going to play. We get Chris Johnson is going to be, I, I think he was called, what, the workhorse they said he was going to be this yeah. week? What, whatever that means for Chris Johnson. I, I don't have a whole lot of faith in him in this one. But, uh, well, what's your take here? Yeah. Uh, look, uh, Chris Johnson, it, we, we saw what he did as a workhorse uh, in those seasons following his 2,000-yard season in Tennessee, and it's mostly just three yards, two yards, one yard, and then 80 yards, you know, so, yeah. um, but that that was six years ago, too, so that, you know, that's temper expectations. As I am a, a CJ question mark K truther, but Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> I will, uh, I'll, I'll calm down this week. Uh, so Carson Palmer, looking at his game splits, uh, um, again, on the road and, and at home throughout his career, uh, it's really steady. It's among the, the most steady um, uh, splits. Uh, he he averages, I, I believe it was a point and a half more uh, fantasy points at, at home than he did on the road. So that doesn't really scare me too much. I think that he's a nice play again. I I like again that John Brown, Carson Palmer stack, and so does the uh, stack generator on Daily Fantasy Cafe. Um, and uh, and then on the on the bear side of the ball, uh, I think there was a lot of concern about Matt Forte and his usage coming in. I mean, he was a workhorse in Week One, and I think that that will continue against an Arizona an Arizona defense that really struggled uh, defending running backs uh, through the air last week. the The Saints um, uh, the Saints running backs caught fourteen balls against yep. uh, Arizona. So Forte had, had maybe the best pass catching back in the league. Uh, you know, he could once again see, uh, I don't know, six, eight receptions. And, and we, I'd love to see what he could do with that. I, I see him as a very safe play this week. Yeah, and I was one of many that whiffed on him week one. I, I didn't have a whole lot of faith in that offense, and they, they surprised me. And he's definitely a guy, especially on DraftKings, where you get the full point there. He doesn't need to get, you know, if he gets his five catches, that, that gives you the floor that you're talking about there that makes him a nice play, certainly. So um, next up, the Bengals and the Chargers, 46-point total. Bengals a small favorite in this one, and uh, like you mentioned here, Vegas expects the Bengals to, you know, kind of run away with this one because they've got a nice, uh, ni- nice team total here, one of the higher ones on the week. And this is a Chargers defense that gave up a lot of yards to the Lions. They weren't, they didn't necessarily close the deal the entire time. You know, they had a lot of opportunities, but Matt Stafford. And you hear these reports now that Golden Tate said that he couldn't feel his fingers in the second half, which I guess would explain the erratic throws by Matt Stafford, but it's not like that's the first time we've seen that from Stafford. No. So um, now they're facing another quarterback who's been erratic at times and Andy Dalton, who looked good against the Raiders. But, you know, as a, a Bengals fan myself, I, I also know that there's, there's downside to this and this was the Raiders. So um, obviously Tyler Eifert saw 12 targets. You may not expect 12 targets again, but he's going to be an integral part of this passing game. And I expect him to be pretty heavily involved again. Yeah, I, I think you know I, Eifert's uh, presence uh, makes Dalton uh, a viable play almost every week. I, I really believe that. I really believe that 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 makes a, a, a huge difference in how we perceive Dalton uh, in, in daily fantasy and, and a redraft if you're streaming quarterbacks. Yeah. Uh, um, Eifert, uh, you know, they he he took advantage that there's never really been anyone who's taken advantage of single coverage while the other teams tilt coverage toward AJ Green, right? So, so he's he's this giant Gronk like guy is able to do it now, and I really like him. You know, pretty much every week, and I think that people should take advantage of Eifert's reasonable price right now because I don't think it'll stay reasonable for very long. Um, but getting over to the um, uh, getting over to the Charger side of things, um, 
you know, let's not expect Keenan Allen to catch 17, what was it, 17 balls last week, 15? Yeah, I, th- I think he caught, what, did he catch 15, 17 targets, I think it yeah. was? Yeah, let's not expect that. But I think, you know, uh, the, the stack generator uh, has them, has the Rivers Allen stack as the seventh highest scoring this week. Uh, so you know that I think that that's that's that makes me pretty bullish uh, on on Allen. You know, seeing a lot of targets. Look, Antonio Gates is is out again. Um, Ladarius Green is getting nice action, but I think that you saw if you watched that Chargers game, you know, Rivers was intent on getting it to Allen over and over in, in every in in every spot, first down, third down, whatever. Uh, so you know, a- Allen Allen's price makes me a little. Iffy. I mean, it, you know, because it, it it jumps so much in one week. Yeah. Um. But um. But if you believe that the Chargers are going to have to throw, and I do, uh, then then he's a good play. Uh, Jeremy Hill, I think is a great play here because, and I'm you know, obviously this is not breaking news, but we 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 really want to get uh, running backs whose teams are favored by three or more. Uh. That that's a that's a big kind of you know uh, line that we want to hit. Where if you can get that, those those running backs tend to perform much better than running backs who face either a, a you know a, a deficit or kind of a neutral back and forth uh, type game. So Jeremy Hill, I think, uh, is a guy who is going to benefit from from the Bengals scoring a lot of points and getting and probably getting a lead here. Yeah, and I mean he's he's a guy they look to a lot in the red zone, and I mean now it's going to be tough to cover. Jeremy Hill, Tyler Eifert, and A.J. Green in the red zone for any team. And the Chargers, not that great. And like you mentioned with Phillip Rivers, I mean, he, he loves a short passing game, as mm-hmm. we saw him getting Stevie Johnson and Danny Woodhead involved last week, too. So a lot of these guys are good targets for the full PPR. I say more so probably on DraftKings. But, I mean, any of these guys could see a decent amount of volume. So yep. definitely like that. Next one, uh, not, not pretty on either side. The Browns and the Titans, 42-point total, which may be kind of generous. Unless you expect Marcus Mariota to throw four touchdown passes in the first half again, but Johnny Manziel getting the start, and I'm I'm one of the people who has has never been shy about my my I won't say dislike for him as a person, but as a football player, as a quarterback, I I think Johnny Manziel is a, a train wreck. I think he's a disaster. But obviously, that's my opinion. Everyone else has other opinions. Give him a chance. He hasn't had many starts, so I personally like the Titans' defense. But why don't you uh, why don't you give me your take on this one and see? about uh, Johnny Johnny football here. Yeah. Uh, you know, Manziel, I, I think I just I want him to be good because like I, 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 I find him to be an incredibly exciting player, although he is occasionally a train wreck. Like we saw last week, I mean, he would take off out of the, out of the pocket, gain 25 yards on the ground, and then next, next play he would just sort of bumble around in the pocket, yeah. get hit, sack, fumble, you know, the, the, whole, the whole disastrous nine yards. So... Um, uh, I you know the Titans, I I think that Manziel being in there actually gives the Titans a higher ceiling here because I think that Manziel is that sort of quarterback who can make those brutal, terrible decisions that lead to a lot of defensive points. And you know Tennessee's defense might not be horrible. Um, uh, you know they they made some changes in the off season, uh, so I I I do I like them as a as a pretty safe play. Um, as far as uh, Mariota goes, uh, I was concerned about his lack of rushing last week. One one rush, I believe, for nine yards. Uh, that's you know that's a little concerning. But we also have to remember that you know the Titans had such a big lead in that one that there was no reason for him to be running around. I think that he's a smart quarterback who understands that. So um, you know if you think that this will be close, then yeah, I think that we'll see Mariota. With a, with a lot more rushing production because he can do it and I think he will. Yeah, and I mean, like you said, it was twenty one nothing before he blinked an eye in that game. And I mean, it, it's it's been the the case with Mariota in his in college and then out through his first week in the NFL. I mean, he's a composed quarterback. He does what he has to do, and there's no need to do more. I mean, no no reason to take unnecessary risks. And I, that's that's one of the things I love about him. All right, yeah. next up we got the Vikings and the Lions. Vikings one of the biggest disappointments. As a team, probably the biggest disappointment, I guess, depending on what expectations you had for them. And obviously, Adrian Peterson alone had pretty high expectations. We thought Teddy Bridgewater have a good season last year and virtually non-existent. So what do you think this was? Was this a product of the 49ers defense actually being good? Or was this the Vikings being bad? Or you think combination of both? Uh, I think the Vikings might be really bad. Uh, and and they're, they're, the offensive line, I mean, you know, 
everything starts there uh, with with that with with any team, but especially with a team that was going to was seemingly going to be reliant on um, on you know Adrian Peterson and and on on Bridgewater having having time to hit those deep targets to Charles Johnson and and Mike Wallace. You know those are two guys who are great deep ball threats who you know might not get many chances this year because Bridgewater is going to be under duress constantly. Uh, I do I do think that Charles Johnson is a reasonable GPP play. I mean, he gets Rasheen Mathis in coverage, who was he was roasted by Keenan Allen last week. Um, that's not the first time we've seen Mathis roasted, no. <laughs> uh, as you know. But um, and and I, I really I really like Charles Johnson as a as a prospect. I know he did he did nothing last week, but the entire Minnesota offense did nothing. Um, so I that's the one one guy I have some exposure to in this game, but I don't have. I don't think I have any Adrian Peterson exposure. I mean, the, the snap count is disturbing. What he did on his touches is disturbing. The downward trend, the age, the offensive line debacle. I just, I don't, I didn't get the appeal going into the season, and, and I'm, I still don't. Yeah, I mean, the most exciting thing about it was Charles Johnson's hair, as usual, for the Kings. <laughs> but um, Amir Abdullah, though, on the other side, um, he had himself a nice, exciting game week one. We, there, was, there was some expectations building up to the week where we thought maybe he would get the start. Then we saw Joyce Bell got the start. But, I mean, Abdullah looked incredible when he got the ball in his hands. So I think he's, uh, he's one of those big-time upside guys. But I don't, know what, I don't know what to think about his floor, though. I don't expect him to have a huge floor. Yeah, no, it, I don't. I don't think that we can assume a floor uh, right now. But uh, Lombardi, the offensive coordinator for Detroit, answered a question about you know has has Amir uh, you know usurped Joy, Joy Bell as the starter. He said something like, "We'll see." Hmm. Uh, so that's you know, I mean, if you're looking for hope, that's hope. Um, and Abdullah is the kind of guy. I mean, this Minnesota run defense, I think, is going to be a target for us all year. Yeah. I have I have some I have some serious exposure to Abdullah this week. Yeah, and I, I think we've seen some stubbornness at times with this Detroit uh, backfield situation in the past couple of years. You know, they brought in Reggie Bush, and he was the guy, then he wasn't the guy, and then Joy Bell was. And so um, I, I'm excited about Abdullah. I love watching that kid play. He, he looked good in Week One, so I'm excited to see him once again this week. Yeah. Uh, Saints and the Buccaneers. This is uh, the home of quite a few popular plays. One in particular, Drew Brees, the guy that everyone's talking about as. Potentially the top quarterback, maybe probably the most highly owned in cash games this week, I would assume. And then, you know, you've got Brandon Cooks, you've got Brandon Coleman, guys that were expecting big things. Neither one had a huge performance in week one, but both guys looked decent. And, you know, like you mentioned, all those backs got a ton of targets. CJ Spiller, I don't think he's officially out this week, but they say even if he plays, he's going to be extremely limited. But they might not need a whole lot because it's a 20. 20- 28 and a half point team total for the Saints are a 10 point favorite in this one. So, I mean, this could be a situation where in the second half we just see Mark Ingram running out the clock. Yeah. I mean, Ingram makes for, like, like I was talking about earlier with Hill, I mean, we want running backs from teams that are favored. And man, when you're favored by 10, yep. I mean, Ingram could eat really, eat well in this one. Um, uh, you know, I, even if Spiller plays, it, it, that doesn't really bother me too much from the Ingram perspective. Uh, I, I, we talked about last week, we talked about Brandon Coleman. Um, he caught four balls last week, which included a touchdown. I think that he's going to become the red zone target, the red zone threat for New Orleans without Jimmy Graham. He's a, he's a big guy, and you know he he saw seven targets, and a lot of those targets uh, last week were were inside the twenty. So I think that we're onto something here if we think that he's going to see high, like you know high value type targets. Yeah. Um. Uh. And uh, I, you know he's still very very cheap. Right now, and I so I the the, the Breeze Coleman stack kind of to me right now is uh is pretty irresistible in, in GPPs. Yeah, and he got he got the some cops to Marquez Colson, who obviously is still around. I mean, maybe more so in actual physical form than the fact that he's playing and producing because he's really not. But I mean, like you said, he is a huge target, and that's 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 something that they definitely needed with Jimmy Graham gone now. So yeah, and uh, the Tampa Bay side. Uh, I'm. I probably won't. I'm. I don't know that I'll have any exposure to this team really. Yeah, I mean Evans is still a little bit iffy about if he'll play. Vincent Jackson was horribly inefficient last week, as he has been for two years now. Um, Mar- uh, uh, not Mariota. Uh, J- Jameis Winston was um, very bad, like like scary bad last week. 
as he was. And you're being kind and saying scary bad because yeah, it might I mean, have been worse than that. <laughs> see, it's, it's ter- I mean, if you're a Bucks fan, you got to just be terrified right now, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but the, you know, and, and then Mark, Doug Martin is a, is a auto fade for me this week because um, we saw. Uh, I think there was, I saw a stat. Uh, he did not play on the last 35 snaps for Tampa last week because they were down by 120 points, and uh, he's not there passing down back. So if you somehow think that the Bucks are going to stay in this one for four quarters, then Martin makes for a decent play, but I just I can't. <laughs> yeah, and if you're one of those people, you're braver than I am because I, yeah. I don't anticipate that either. Um, next up, the Giants and the Falcons get into another really interesting game here. This one's got some big-time upside. 51-point total. Giants, 27-point team total. Falcons, 24. Of course, Julio Jones was the popular play, the chalk, last week as far as elite receivers went. And he didn't disappoint. 141 yards, two touchdowns. Looks virtually unstoppable against that Eagles defense. And it's not much of a downgrade facing this Giants secondary this week either. So um, it's going to be an interesting one. Matt Ryan and Julio was... I don't know the numbers, but it was one of the more popular stacks last week. And I imagine it won't be quite as highly owned this week, but still should be a pretty popular GPP target. Yeah, I, I was looking at Matt Ryan's game splits, expecting to see uh, really disastrous stuff uh, from his home road uh, splits, just because yeah, I feel like the Falcons just you score a lot of points at home, and then when they get outdoors, not so much. It's, act- it's actually not true. I mean, he's, he's steady. He's steady on the road. Um, so, yeah, I, I like that stack. I think that the that like the the hate stack this week is the OBJ Eli once again, um, where you know pe- people were burnt. I was burned last week by it, and in, in, in a lot of places. Uh, so I saw you know just 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 gauging the feeling you know on on DFS this week. I've seen seen and read a lot of uh, you know never again with Eli, never again with OBJ. And that's a ridiculous uh, way to think about this game. And but it's true, and I think you'll see people fleeing, running away from both of those players this week, particularly Eli. Um, but this, you know, twenty-seven point total. It's I think he makes for a really nice play, especially after coming down in price a little bit. Yeah, and I mean that's and that's a great thing, especially in week two, particularly in the NFL. We see all these overreactions and you know generalizations. Everyone said, well, this is a fact because we saw this in week one, and yeah. th- these these guys are terrible, and these other guys can't be stopped, and things like that. So if you can if you can decipher which things are actual trends and which things are just a fluke, well, may, yeah. not necessarily a fluke, but you know, not a trend, then that can definitely set you apart. And I, I I'm going back to the well here. I'll have at least uh, a couple of these. Uh, Eli it's OBJ stacks. Yeah, and and uh, it, if anyone's interested in checking out the stack generator, I did a, a three-headed stack: a, a quarterback, wide receiver, wide receiver stack. And the best one out there is Matt Ryan, Julio, and Roddy. Uh, mm-hmm. So that that's that. I like that one. That one a lot. Although, uh, you know, you're you're really putting a lot of eggs in one basket there. True, but when we saw Roddy, I mean, he was one of those guys that I I didn't have huge hopes for in Week One, but I mean, he was he was effective. I think he had 84 yards, eight targets, something like that. So. Yeah. Not the upside that he once had, but certainly a guy that's still got a nice floor in that passing game. Sure. It's also nice that they finally have a running back that can actually, you know, I know. move the ball, which Tevin Coleman wasn't – his numbers weren't great, 20 for 80, but I thought he looked good running the ball. I thought he was made good decisions, and there just wasn't a ton of room. I mean, it's it's some threat of a run. Yeah, exactly, which is a lot more than the zero that they had before with that yeah. running back by committee. Yeah. Um, this next one's going to be fun. The Steelers and the 49ers – we were mentioning the 49ers earlier a little bit. This is the defense that a lot of people were not high on coming into the season, I being one of them. And the Steelers, obviously on the opposite side, still missing Le'Veon Bell. But, of course, Antonio Brown, a guy that wasn't targeted quite as much as we would have thought last week. But we saw Heath Miller had 11 targets as well. So, obviously, the volume is going to be there for the Steelers. And if this 49ers defense really does, you know, once again show up as a stout running defense, which... I, I'm not convinced that they necessarily are, but D'Angelo Williams is certainly no Le'Veon Bell, so this could be a scenario where we see Ben Roethlisberger air it out quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I think that, that we will see uh, uh, Steelers throw a lot. Um, so uh, Roethlisberger and Antonio Brown are the highest scoring projected uh, quarterback wide receiver stack for this week, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I, you know, Brown Brown is for me is just like a. Uh, set it and forget it cash game guy I mean it, and and I'm, I'm not the only one he's just he's so heavily targeted he does a lot with his targets um, we saw that you know even even in week one in a really bad game otherwise he ended up 
he ended up with what, like 27 fantasy points yeah. on DraftKings. So, um, so you know, he's in a lot of my lineups. Uh, and, you know, Heath Miller, you were talking about Heath Miller. He's still cheap, and he's the number two uh, target in that offense until Mar- Martavis Bryant gets back, and maybe even then. Uh, so, you know, they, to, to be able to, to buy a number two target for that almost rock bottom cost is very rare. Um, I, I like him a lot. I have him as a, as a cash game play in a ton of places. Yeah, I mean, and that's a really great point there because people don't – rarely do you look at a guy that's – a guy like Keith Miller at his age and things like that without – he's not a big play threat, but he's certainly a volume threat. And like we were already talking about, this is a volume passing offense, especially with Bell out. So um, I like that call a lot. I mean, he's, you mentioned how cheap he is. That's, that's a really good call that I, I don't think a lot of people are on with – the week of the tight end in week one, everyone everyone wants Tyler Eifert and Jason Witten yeah. and then all these guys, but guys like Heath Miller are going to go overlooked. So I think that's a really good call. And yeah, but, I like I like Heath over over Witten this week. Yeah, that, that that's I feel like people are going to think that's a bold call. I don't think it's necessarily a bold call because I mean even including all the fourth quarter production that Witten had, I mean he still only had I think eight targets last week. So mm-hmm. um, Witten definitely a, a big upside. And then of course on the other side of this one, you got Carlos Hyde who looked phenomenal in week one, a guy that I. I'll be. I'll admit that I didn't have as much exposure as I'd like to him, but I mean his price on DraftKings is absolutely insane. I mean that's that's a guy I'm locking into my cash games this week. Yeah, you know what, fifty one hundred, and yeah. and I mean that's that's so low. You just look at the players around him, and you won't believe it. But um, you know Reggie Bush is out this week, uh, so presumably Hyde will not just be you know a, a two down basher. I mean he he could he could uh, see see a lot of snaps. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't expect, I don't expect him to, you know, do what he did last week. But we don't need that. I mean, he's so cheap. His price was locked in, obviously, because he was a, a Monday. Uh, you know, he played on Monday, um, and you know, he plays the Pittsburgh defense. That um, while they look bad through the air last against the Patriots, they also look really bad against the run, yep. right? And I mean, they were they, they were giving up chunk plays to the Patriots at, at one point, um, and uh, so you know, I. I think that Hyde is, yeah, Hyde's just a locked in guy. Yeah, I mean, it was Deion Lewis too, which is not, which is not a player that's the talent level of Carlos Hyde either. Um, Washington against St. Louis. This one we probably won't spend much time on. Um, you got Kirk Cousins and obviously uh, Deshaun Jackson out. So Pierre Garcon, a guy that a lot of people are talking about as a value play this week, which we've seen him be a volume pass catcher in this mm-hmm. offense before. But also Jordan Reed, not 100% here, listed as questionable now. Um, I think it was a hamstring he tweaked in practice, something of that nature. So um, the Rams defense, though, one I mean, one of the better front sevens in all of football. So um, is this a defense you're targeting as one of your one of your go tos here? Yeah, if I'm paying up for a defense uh, this week, it is the Rams. Uh, they, you know, uh, late last season they played at Washington, like they are you know, this week, uh, and they they went berserk. Um, I have the the stats in in my in my slate breakdown if you like check it out. But they were they were really really they were dominant against an overmatched Washington offense. Um, I know that the the Washington offense really held its own against the Dolphins defense, but I, I just think the Rams the Rams defense is a different on a different level. Uh, so, incredibly aggressive, uh, you know, incredibly opportunistic. And um, I fear for I fear for her cousins and company. Honestly, that's it, I think it could get really ugly. And I so I uh, I really do like them. Yeah, I mean you said it well in your article here. Dan Snyder's never ending clown show. So that's uh, that's, that's, that's that's the way to put it, and it makes a lot of sense because I mean that's that's what it looks like right now, especially with um, the big play threat and Deshaun Jackson out of there. That's just not a not an offense that has much upside here. No. Speaking of offenses that don't have much upside, the Jacksonville Jaguars against the Miami Dolphins, who Dolphins ended up being a, a fine defense play in week one. A lot of that due to the fact that Jarvis Landry ran that punt back. That certainly helped um, and helped his value there as well. But the Jacksonville side, that's an instant no thanks for me. Um, that They didn't even break 10 points in week one. And this Dolphins, I mean, defensive line in itself, very good. So, um, But there are some viable options on the Miami side, though. Yeah, uh, you know, once again, so we have Jeremy Hill, Mark Ingram, and now Lamar Miller, uh, three running backs whose teams are favored by a lot, and um, you know, so who who could see a lot of action uh, in a in a really positive game script, and uh, you know, Miller was disappointing in week one. There's no two ways about it. I mean, at halftime, I think he had no fantasy points. It was really bad, but 
when they finally started giving him the ball, he was uh, he was ripping off nice runs. I mean, he, I think he averaged five and a half yards a carry um, against Washington. Uh, so I I do at at his suppressed price. I actually I actually do like him. One thing that intrigued me um, the uh, the line here changed pretty dramatically, or the uh, total for the Dolphins. The Dolphins were projected for 28 points in early in the week, and now they're projected for 24. Um, so I don't read too much into that, but that's um, a big swing, though. Yeah, it's a huge swing. That's like that's like a swing that happens if like Tannehill gets injured in practice, right? Yeah. And play. So I just I I have Miller, I have some Miller, I have a little bit of Jarvis Landry. I don't have any Ryan Tannehill this week, and like you said, the Jet the Jags offense. It's such a debacle that I don't even think that they can benefit from garbage time production right now. I, um, you know, unfortunately, because I think they have a lot of weapons who could. Yeah, yeah, it's just not a good situation there in Jacksonville, as has been the case for quite some time now. Um, perennial bottom feeders on offense here last couple seasons. And uh, another bottom feeder type of offense, the Raiders going up against the Ravens. Obviously, Terrell Suggs a big loss for the Ravens, but not a big enough loss that that's going to scare me away from playing them a ton this week. This is a Raiders offense that was down 33 points before they got on the board last week. Ended up with a couple late touchdowns, and I don't think it matters which quarterback plays. This is a terrible offense, and I mean, this is a defense that kept Peyton Manning out of the end zone last week. So this is uh, this is one of the best spots, maybe maybe the best spot for a defense this week. Yeah, um, I I also think it's worth mentioning that you know the Ravens, uh, although this is a cross country game, the Ravens did not go back home. Uh, after the Denver game, they went straight to California. Uh, I know that you know that's a little narrative there, but um, I think that if you're hesitant to play any team that has to travel cross country, just remember that that's not the case here. Uh, but yeah, Ravens are super super safe. Uh, uh, Justin Forsett disappointing in Week One. He still saw nice volume in the passing game, and he is going to look at Mark Tressman isn't so much the quarterback whisperer as he is the running back whisperer, okay? Uh, those those running backs in Tressman's offense get a lot of action in the passing game, and Forsett's good in that game. So, I mean, in, in that aspect. Uh, so I actually, I, I have I have quite a bit of exposure uh, to Forsett this week against, uh, you know, what, what you said, like you said, I mean, a really bad Raiders defense. And, and I think that he's also a contrarian play because people are – I would guess would be off of him, right after yeah. last. Yeah, it's, it's another one of those things that we were talking about the the recency bias and week one overreactions. Everyone's like, "Well, Justin Forsett was terrible, no thanks," and they just move on, which is great for people that want to play him in tournaments. And I mean, he, he's probably not even a bad cash game play either with uh, with his uh, his floor in this game. Yeah, I, I agree. All right, lots of good cash game GPP plays, whatever you want to have here. Cowboys against the Eagles, highest total on the week. 55 points, obviously. Eagles with a 30-point total. Cowboys, 25. No Des Bryant here. Everyone's flocking to Jason Witten and Terrence Williams as their value plays. And, I mean, while I don't blame him, I, Terrence Williams is a guy that, I mean, we've seen him before. He's never been a volume type of receiver. He's been the deep threat kind of guy. So he's not just going to instantly step into this Des Bryant role, as we know, of course. But Tony Romo, also a guy that does a great job of spreading the ball around. We saw Lance Dunbar have seven catches last week for over 80 yards. And, um, obviously, game strip, script kind of dictated that. But this is an Eagle offense, too, that's interesting because you get DeMarco Murray coming back against the Cowboys, who had a whopping nine yards rushing last week. So um, a lot of, a lot to go around here. And you know probably the most popular play from this one outside of those two Cowboys guys has got to be Jordan Matthews. Uh, Jordan Matthews could have, you know, like the highest ownership of any wide receiver in the game this, this week because, you know, he played on Monday, so his price was locked in. His week one price was locked in for week two, and and he, um, you know, so he's just he's a cash game option. He's OGPP play because I think his his ceiling is really really nice here. Um, uh, so I have him everywhere because I I just I just feel like he's just a, a guy, kind of a almost a no a no brainer. He was targeted thirteen times uh, in in uh, Monday's loss. Uh, he should have had that touchdown. I mean, I think that he's on the verge of a major, major breakout. Uh, that did that touchdown hurt you? It hurt oh, me. Oh, it killed me. I had I had Sam Bradford and, and Jordan Matthews in all my cash games, so that was. Uh, yeah. I, I saw that, and I, I mean, obviously, it was they were going to get the touchdown anyway, more than likely, and they did. But 
I'm not, um, I, I was yelling at my TV about as loud as I did last week. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was begging for for a replay. I mean, Chip Kelly, you know, you know, he he uh, he, do, he doesn't care much. I don't think about <laughs> about those things. So. Uh, I think Chip Kelly was just like, whatever, we're just going to run it in right here anyway. Yeah, I, uh, I feel like I, I, I considered making an effort to try to run to the stadium and stop I, the play in first, just in case. <laughs> you and me both. I would have right, been right behind you. Uh, yeah. that, was, that was devastating. <laughs> yeah, um, that, was, that was a big one. The, the, uh, the, st- the stack generator, I, you know, I'm, I'm a little uh, hesitant to go all in on the, um, on the Cowboys uh, this week, you know, without Dez. I mean, that's it's just, it's a... It's a significant loss. It's just it it is, uh, and there's no way to get around that. Um, but the stack generator really does like the Romo Witten Terrence Williams three headed uh, stack. Uh, so you know that's that's just something to keep in mind when you're when you're thinking about what to do with this game. There are really so many options with this game, including Darren Sproles, who you know is he's uh, thirty five hundred dollars yeah. on uh, on DraftKings. You know his floor is still scary because. You know, we saw at times last year he was basically just not involved in the offense. Um, but uh, I think that um, I think that his you know his ceiling in that in that in that short passing game that was really ripping the, the Falcons in the second half those dump offs those little screens uh, to him and Matthews and Murray. I, I just you know I I really think that that Sproles could be a nice GPP option. Yeah, I mean he he pulled in or he had ten targets last week. I mean I know. I'm one of those people that everyone calls me crazy. Every year, I'm the guy that drafts Darren Sproles, and everyone says, what the hell are you doing? Why It's Darren Sproles, and I say it's PPR. I mean, he's going to have those games each year, much like last week. I mean, I think he put up 19 points in a, P- a standard PPR league, things like that. So, I mean, he's, he's a guy. I love watching Darren Sproles play. You know, he just defies logic at his size, like his, his elusiveness. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Next one's going to be a fun one to watch. The Packers against the Seahawks, 49-point total. I was a little surprised to see it this high, but Cam Chancellor being out is a huge loss for the Seattle yep. defense and uh, his pocketbook. And at the same time, this is a Seattle defense that didn't look great in week one against the Rams offense. It is, it's not a very good offense. I mean, it's an okay offense, but it's nothing, nothing necessarily above average. And, you know, this one, in years past, we'd expect, you know, a 21-17 type of game, but... Vegas has it pegged as one of the higher totals on the week, and um, James Jones back looking good for the Packers. So this is going to be a game that might be an interesting one to target more than some people would. Absolutely, uh, you know, I talked about it in the article, but uh, you know, on the surface, it seems okay. Well, if they fade Aaron Rodgers this week, but I don't think that that's the play at all. I, I think um, you know, even though Richard Sherman is expected to be on Randall Cobb for most of the game. I still think that you know you play Rodgers because he's just uber efficient. You know he just I think he averaged like 0.87 fantasy points per drop back last week, which is just off the charts, just ridiculous. And um, and you know yeah yeah James Jones looks like he like he never left. Uh, Devonte Adams uh, you know is there. I think I think we're gonna see Richard Rodgers get get involved. I think that um, you know. That when teams start paying more attention to James Jones in the red zone, that Rodgers will get more involved at, at tight end. But um, yeah, I, I I still I really like Aaron Rodgers in this one, and I for the for the same reason I like Russell Wilson because I think that the Seahawks are going to be forced to step up the tempo and and really you know try to score points have to have to really you know uh, step it up um, like they did at times against against St. Louis. So. Um, while I, I, I'm not playing Russell Wilson in cash games because I think there are three or four, you know, much better options, I I also think that he's a, a reasonable play in, in you know in, in in larger formats. Yeah, and uh, another guy that's uh, probably more of a GPP play, but Marshawn Lynch got targeted seven times last week, and this Packers defense gave up almost 200 yards on the ground to the Bears Week One. So um, yeah, I think he's he's the guy that's got a nice a, a solid floor, maybe not so much for his price, but certainly a, a big upside guy as well. Absolutely. Next one here, not a whole lot of upside, at least on one side. The Colts against the Jets. Colts 27-point total, Jets 20. Um, it's the Monday night game, which, you know, good for the Jets to get one more Monday night game in before they completely fall out of relevance again. But yeah. um, you got T.Y. Hilton, who's questionable, maybe on the wrong side of questionable. I guess there's not a whole lot of concrete evidence there. We don't really know. But Dante Moncrief saw 11 targets last week, obviously, uh, Andrew Luck, this is a, a pass-first offense. Frank Gore did not look good in week one. I mean, the entire team didn't until garbage time. 
But uh, Chris Ivory looked good last week as well on the Jets side. Really the only guy that did anything. So this one, I feel like it's, it's a sneaky place to target because it's 47-point total. And Andrew Luck, another one of those recency bias things. People are going to say, well, what the hell was I doing paying up for Andrew Luck when he didn't do anything until the fourth quarter? Sure. But, I mean... You put that in perspective. Once we see how Tom Brady does against that defense, you can get a, a better idea of how good that defense really is. Yeah, and we I mean we talked about it a lot last week where it was like auto fade for yeah. for Colt for every Colt <laughs> last week, uh, including Luck. And you know, he saved his day sort of with some fourth quarter junk time uh uh production. But uh I, I I really, I'd like to hear, I'd like to see more about what, what Revis, how Revis is going to be used in this game because uh, I love Dante Moncrief both as a prospect and as an option this week. Um, if, if Hilton sits, have you heard if Hilton is sitting yet? I, I haven't checked in the last like, I, hour. Before. I haven't seen that he's officially sitting. I, I've, last I heard was game time decision, which uh, is probably the worst words you can hear as a DFS player for anyone, especially on a Monday night game. Yeah, but you know, even with Hilton in the lineup last week, Moncrief saw ten or eleven targets. Yeah. So you know, I, I think that Andre Johnson's demise might be the key factor here. You know, in in, in Moncrief's uh, opportunity uh, against the Jets and and going forward, uh, one play I lo- I really like as sort of a pivot uh, from from other popular receivers is Eric Decker. Um, Decker, I know he only saw three targets. He caught two of them, one for a touchdown. Uh, last week against the Browns, um, but he is uh, going to play primarily from the slot. Uh, and um, uh, Vontae Davis, the shutdown quarter for corner for Indy, um, plays exclusively outside. So he is going to be on Brandon Marshall most likely for the for the whole game. And that leaves Decker uh, facing guys who you know were burned last week and were burned a lot last year. Uh, so I think I see this one as as so you know game you know Indy's expected to win by seven. I, I think Indy will maybe run away, and I think the Decker could see could see a lot of opportunity uh, from a quarterback in Ryan Fitzpatrick who loves his his slot guys. Uh, you know, we we saw that with Delaney Walker lining up in the slot when he was uh, when Fitz was in Tennessee. Uh, so I, I I have Decker in a lot of GPP lineups. I really like his ceiling. Yeah, and I, I'm with you there. I'm in absolute agreement. I mean, Vontae Davis is the guy that. I find out who he's on, and I mean, I, I don't touch that receiver. I just, he's so good. I, I think he's the best cover corner in football already. Yeah, I, I, I instantly don't, avoid him. Yeah. I, don't, I don't disagree. Yeah, yeah, he's incredible. So, uh, no Brandon Marshall for me. I'm with you there. Eric Decker, a nice sneaky GPP play that I really haven't seen anyone talking about. So, um, that's going to wrap it up. That's the Monday night game. Um, check us out on Twitter at DF Cafe. He is at CD Carter 13 And uh, we look forward to next week, breaking down week three. And good luck this week.